Can you guys keep down the noise, please? Hello. Welcome to another live on White Baby Gardening and Worm Farm. How are you guys doing? We're going to be talking about whatever you want to discuss. So our fall has begun and I managed to get everything outside that I need to done. Still haven't sterilized my soil yet, but I'm going to be doing that indoors. So I'm not worried about that. Were you guys able to, for those of you who's growing season hand, were you able to take care of all of your outdoor activities, your gardening activities? So I have a lot of plans for this winter, quite a few things that I need to get done. So I'm going to be working a lot in my garage over the course of the winter on my worm farm. Okay, so there are a lot of things that I have been trying to get done for the last year. And so far, I have not been successful because there's just too many things that need to get done. So this winter, I'm going to try and see, provided that the garage is warm enough. <laughs> If I can spend a lot of time, um, some time out there and get some things done. So I'm going to be doing quite a lot of experiments. Um, for the most part, I'm going to be taking you guys along with me as I do these experiments. And there are a lot of testing on my castings that I've always wanted to get done. So some of them, I cannot do them right away. So I have to plan for them. I have to allow time. Like, for example, I want to test my castings to see how, what level of nutrients is in the castings. I want to get it tested to see if using the food source, mostly my main concern is the compost that I feed the worms because, as you know, um, I collect compost from the free compost depot and feed it to my worms, but then those composts come from people in the environment who may be cutting their lawn or they might be pruning trees and stuff like that. So I don't know what they use on their lawn. I don't know if what they use on their lawn is organic or if it is inorganic. So I want to get my castings tested to see what if there's any herbicides or pesticides in them. Because if so, then I know that I would have to stop using those, that compost. Yes, sad it would be because, I mean, I can collect any amount of it that I want. It would be sad, but, so that is one of my plans. I'm going to get that tested. And then you know that I have the Dutch elm trees in my yard that can cause Dutch elm disease if it is composted. But I don't know if it can be used for vermicompost, if it would have the same effects, because I do know that the worm bodies do break down whatever is in the food source that they eat and turn it into plant nutrients. So I don't know if the worm body is able to break down that liquid that is in the Dutch elm that actually caused the Dutch elm disease. So I'm going to... Get, I'm going to be experimenting. So I'm going to get one of my little experimental bins. I'm going to get a few worms put in there. And then I'm going to get those, some of those leaves and feed it to the worms. Just that. I'm not going to add anything else to it apart from moisture, of course. 
And then after they have composted it, I want to get those tested because I have so many of those leaves. I have four of the trees in my yard. So if I can feed that to my worms and the worms can process that substance that is attracting the Dutch elm beetles, then it would be nice if I can use it to feed my worms. So I'm going to be getting that tested as well. Yeah, so those are two things that I want to get done. Now, it is so difficult to find somewhere who will actually do the testing for you. Um, for the nutrients in my casting, I try to find places that will do the testing. And it is, I don't even know how to describe it, but the main thing, I want to know pretty much the, all the plant nutrients that is available in the castings. But based on all the places, oh, hi, growing in my home, how are you? Based on the all the people that I talked to, the organizations that I spoke to, they will do testing for, um, not potassium, phosphorus and nitrogen and the calcium. But what happened to potassium? That is one of the major plant nutrients. So why not? Why is that not a part of the group that they test for? It can be added in, but it's not just readily available for testing. So I don't know, I still have a few more places that I need to talk to because it would be nice if I have a breakdown of the nutrients that is in my casting so that when someone wants casting, I can say, okay, these are the nutrients that it contains and I can know for a certainty. And then the next thing is I want to be doing, I want to do an experiment with more carbon to nitrogen and I want to do an experiment with equal carbon to nitrogen and see food source for the worms that is and see how that turns out um, in terms of nutrients. So I'll be getting that tested also. So those are some of the experiments and the testing that I need to get done. And I'm going to be running quite a few experiments with the various worms that I have. I have Canadian night crawlers, European night crawlers, African night crawlers, and red wrigglers. So I thought it would be interesting to see, compare all four of them, see how they perform in the worm bin, if any of them feed faster, and just about everything I can learn about them. So I'm going to be doing those experiments over the course of the winter. Growing my home, do you still have a garden going at this time? Or have you harvested everything from your garden by now? Yes. Oh, so my African night crawlers, the ones, for those who watch my previous videos, the one that, the bin that had the worm constantly trying to escape, I brought those indoors. Uh, they have been indoors for almost a week now. But you know the funny thing about it? They're indoors. My house is hot. <laughs> As you know, I'm Jamaican, so I'm going to go for the hotter side. And they're still not settling down. Well, most of them are settled, but when you open the bin, you'll still see some of them on the sides of the bin. So I don't know. I don't think it is too hot for them because we try to not make it too hot because then you have to go outside and the drastic change in temperatures sometimes can not cannot be too healthy for you so we try not to keep it we keep it like 21 22 so it should be warm enough for them but they're still crawling up the sides of the bin in the garage where the bin is underneath the heat and the, that area is 26 degrees they're not crawling out so i don't know if these guys want to be at 26 too but anyway, I brought them indoors, so we'll see how they do. At least I'm not seeing as many of them crawling up and down all over the bin. So let's see. Growing my horn says I have some cauliflower in the garden and switch charts. Okay, nice. So only the cool weather crops you can grow now, right?
Yeah, so that those are some of the things that I'm going to be working on. And then, oh, hi, Helpy, how are you? Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to be taking inside my house every type of worms that I have. So I won't be bringing in any Canadian nightcrawlers because, you know, I already have some in my fridge. Oh, I'm doing okay, LP. I'm doing okay. Yes, I'm going to be bringing in some, well, I have some of the African nightcrawlers in already, so that's fine. So I'm going to be bringing in some red wrigglers because the bin that I always keep indoors for in case anything happened to my worms outdoors, that has been outside for pretty much maybe five, six months <laughs> because I took the bin out to harvest the casting and I've been so busy that the castings and the worms, they're just sitting there in the container. I haven't harvested that casting yet. And I guess mostly because the casting is a bit wet. So because of that, I haven't harvested the castings. And then sometimes because of where I have it in the garage, sometimes I do forget about it. <laughs> yes, I'm bad with that. I have to keep, I have a lot of little side bins as it were. And because they're not really on the worm shelves, so sometimes you tend to forget about them, unfortunately. So I'm going to have to work on that and try to see if I can get all the worms in a similar location. Then I won't forget. Helpy, how are your worms doing? Yes, yeah, so... I have quite a bit of plants for my garden. So I managed to get the, to make the covers for, or the doors for my worm shelf, but I haven't installed most of them yet. Some of them are up. So I'm going to be showing you that in a video after I get all the doors up. Now I'm um, over the course of the winter, I'm going to be making the, covers that is going to go directly on each of the worm bins but it's quite a lot of them that I have to make as I have 60 bins at the moment so it's quite a lot of them that I have to make so I'm just gonna take my little time I'll get there eventually to get them done let's see okay you're doing good oh I'm sorry, I'm getting a call, but I cannot take that call at the moment. So I'm just going to message that person. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so you're doing good LP. Let's see. LP says, I have not been as hands on lately. Need to make that schedule. My blue worm bin, mixed worm bin, has to be harvested and I'm going to start two more bins. Oh, nice. One for my baby ENC. I had separated from castings into a small container. Now they need a bigger one. Okay. Nice. Hi, Hoity. How are you? Yes, yeah, so quite a lot to be done this winter. And then I think I'm finally going to resume working on my worm book. I don't know when I'm going to have it published because it's going to take quite a while for me to finish it. It's not going to be a big book. It's just going to be a thin little book. But I'm trying to organize the book in a way where it is very simple, easy to follow for new worm farmers. And I also want to make it where it is very detailed for people who have been worm farming for a bit but would like to learn more. Yeah, so... I guess putting the information is not the difficult part, but um, how to organize the book is my biggest challenge. 
Yes, yeah, so I'm going to have to sit down and spend some time and figure out how I want it. And then sourcing pictures. Because I don't want it to be just a plain little book with no pictures in there. So sourcing the appropriate pictures can be a bit tricky. Yeah, so I have quite a bit of research that I need to do to see where I can get pictures for my book because for example if i'm talking about things like insects that can be found in the worm bin i'm not going to have all those insects in my worm bin so sourcing good quality pictures and getting permission to use those pictures can be a bit tricky so i don't know how long it's gonna take to get the book done let's see pieces and I collected some native composting worms nice from outside a couple months ago they're of the genus Octolations if I got that right I'm experimenting raising them indoors had four and last check there were ten. Oh, nice interesting never heard of those worms I'm gonna we jot that down. I'd like to see what they look like, so I'm going to research them. <laughs> so what do those worms look like, LP? see okay and he says that's a great undertaking writing a book i'll buy a copy okay thank you my dear no indoors they are much smaller um it's only natural that they're going to be worms are going to be smaller when you take them out of their habitat because i mean they're in confinement whereas when they're outdoors they are free to move around and do whatever they do. So it's not really a surprise that they are smaller. Of course, there's always a chance that they could also be bigger too in the in confinement because you now they have access to all sorts of food source where outdoors they may not be available or they may not have access to that much food source. So it's a give and take, but it will be interesting. <laughs> Maybe you could put... um pictures of them on Instagram so we can see what they look like. But that's an interesting adventure. Sounds like fun. Yes, yeah, so... Okay, you will share. Good. Oh, yes, LP, I saw your... Um, on your Instagram, those purple potatoes that you harvested, they're looking really good. It's a nice size too. I've never really seen them that big before. Yes, because when we buy them in the stores here, they're not very big. I've never seen them big. So there, I was pretty surprised when I saw the size of them because I didn't really know they grow to that size because I've only seen those purple potatoes here in the stores i've never seen them when i was in jamaica we have some that is um dark color but it's not purple it's more of a orangish red but i've never seen the purple ones until i moved here and you hardly ever see them here either yes they're not easy to find in the stores but there were those that you harvested they were pretty big i was impressed so you did a pretty good job with those did you grow any other potatoes apart from those purple ones? Okay, you found them on the wood skid that was rotting. So are they worms that you always come across or is it um, where you seen them for the first time? See, IT says, I just been throwing my yard worms into my raised bed. Is that okay? 
it depends on what type of yard worms you have. If it is the regular earthworms, then it's not really okay for them because the regular earthworms, although they eat organic matter, they are not composting worms and they don't do well in confinement. Oh, you said you're putting them in your raised bed. Yes, if you're putting them in your raised bed, that is, there's no, no problem with that. They will do okay. If you're putting them in a bin, like a worm bin, then that's not okay. But if you put them in your raised beds, oh yes, the more the merrier. <laughs> Just keep putting them in there and make sure that you have a lot of organic matter in that raised bed because once you have a lot of organic matter, those worms are just going to be multiplying. Of course, they won't multiply at the rate like um, composting worms, but they're still going to be multiplying and they're going to be aerating your worm, your raised bed. They're going to be helping your raised bed to retain moisture because that's what their castings do, help the soil to retain moisture. It's going to help to prevent erosion, although it is in a raised bed, so I don't think you should have any issues with erosion. But then, yes, yeah, so it's going to help to have moist, um, to maintain the moisture in a bit. And it is also going to help to control pests, some pests that can be found in your soil if they have an exoskeleton. So yes, put them all in there as much as you can put in there. LP says, thank you. However, the ones from the store was quite large. Oh, okay. Those I harvested are quite long like carrots. Yes, I noticed that. Thank you. Yes, store-bought white potatoes, seed-grown clancy, and the sweet potatoes. Oh, okay. And if I say potatoes, I'm talking about sweet potatoes. <laughs> Yes, I just call, um, in Jamaica, we don't really say sweet potatoes, we just say potatoes. And then when we're talking about potatoes, we say Irish or Irish potatoes. <laughs> so sometimes when I'm talking, you'll hear me say potatoes. In my discussion, I'm actually talking about sweet potatoes. Let's see, LP says, I don't think I've seen them before. Okay, maybe I have but didn't know but I scoured the internet trying to identify them. Okay, cool. LP says, I had moved the skid and found them there, so I collected. <laughs> yeah, so let's see what they do. It will be interesting. So um, I would observe them like for three months, like starting at the beginning. So say for example, now, you count how many you have and you know how they say worms multiply at least three times or double their amount in three months yes yeah, so i would count how much i have now and then after three months i would count again to see if they multiply at a fast rate you might end up with them being less than doubled they might have doubled or more than doubled but yes i would count them because it would be interesting to see how they do it's a pity you don't do videos because I'd like to see a video on what they're doing. <laughs> Whitey says, organic matter like fruits and vegetable straps, scraps. Yes, um, pretty much any type. If you have compost, like finished compost or food scraps, leaves, um, your grass clippings, anything, any form of organic matter that you have. Um, I would not necessarily recommend meat and dairies, although they will eat those things, but to avoid other pests, I wouldn't recommend putting those in your raised beds. But yes, pretty much any organic matter that you have. Of course, if you have a tree branch, you don't want to put the wood in there because wood takes long to break down. And even if it is just the little sticks, you don't necessarily want to put those in your raised bed because they tend to take long to break down and not only do they take long they absorb nitrogen because for wood to break down they need a high source of nitrogen so if you put sticks and those things or wood chips in your bed 
you need to ensure that it is only on the surface and not in the soil because once it is in the soil, it is going to be using up the nitrogen that, you, that your plants need and you don't really want to be using up the nitrogen because then your plants will suffer. So if you're using wood chips in your garden, it's a good idea to um, make sure that it is wood chip that has already gone through the composting process. So even if it's not broken down fully, you want to know that it at least went through the heat process and so it's just at that point where it's ready to start breaking down without absorbing too much of the nitrogen from your soil. LP says, oh, okay, that's, um, that's interesting to know the different cultural dialect. We specify sweet potatoes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's, um, yes, we all do have our own dialect. I'm black and I'm proud of it. I wouldn't want to be any other skin color. So let's report this person and report. Okay. Okay. Hi, Han White, how are you? Let's see, LP says, I'll do an update soon from my last check. Then again, this week when I put them in a bigger bin. Okay, good. So far they do not reproduce quickly. Okay. Well, since as it's a worm that you're not used to and probably not a worm that is often used for composting, it could actually take a while for them to get used to being in confinement, as well as it could be that they are just worms that don't reproduce very fast because a lot of worms do not reproduce fast. We know that the worms that are used for composting tend than worms that are not readily used for composting. So, yes, it doesn't necessarily mean they're unhappy where they are. LP says, Heck yeah, White Baby. I think you're awesome. Oh, thank you, my dear. <laughs> Okay, you were sleeping on white. You must be tired though. Let's see, Whitey says, first time doing a fall garden this year. Doing very well. Mm, nice. Do you do videos, Whitey? So what do you have go going in your fall garden? Are you able to plant things that love the warm weather or can you just plant anything? Or, you, or can you just plant cool weather crop? Let's see, okay. I'm right and LP are saying greetings. Okay. Let's see. Good point. I do need to observe what conditions they do well in. Yes. Um, and share it. And please feel free to share it on Instagram. LP, are you ever thinking about doing videos on YouTube? Not to fast in your business or to be inquisitive, but I think you would do great at it.
Yeah, so anyway, have you guys, for those of you who do videos on YouTube, are you having issues with YouTube taking your hours away? Because I hear quite a few complaining that YouTube is actually taking their hours away. And it's not as if they're taking the hours just once. It's just like every week their hours are being taken. So it's kind of strange. I've never really heard of something like that happening before, but still trying to figure out what it is that is going on, why that is happening. I've never experienced it for myself, but I've heard of others having that issue. Let's see. It says, I had greens, kohlrabi, carrots, cabbage, and beets. Okay, nice. Should be a nice harvest for the fall. So, like, how long do you have leave in your growing season for this fall then, um, IT? LP says, oh, thanks. I have. I thought I'd join IG first and see how I feel about putting my life out there. <laughs> um, yes, I think for a lot of us, that is a big a big concern putting your life out there and if you notice for those of you who saw my first set of videos for the first year or so i was not showing myself in my videos it was just um just what i'm doing is what i would show but not my face in the videos because um being in public is no big deal for me because i'm used to that as one of jova's witnesses i'm always out there meeting a lot of people anyway but um, for some for some reason, just and I'm not afraid of being in the camera. But I like to be private with what um, I like to keep my life private. So for that reason, and then you know how people are. We're always curious about one another. So sometimes people will come on and they will ask you personal questions and stuff like that. So because of that, initially I was not doing, not showing myself in the videos. But then I find that when you don't show yourself in your videos, there are some videos, depending on what topic it, it is, that will do very well, like some channel, not just individual videos, but some channels where you will not see the speaker, none at all. And I'm talking about big channels. But depending on the information that they bring, sometimes the information is just so good that they will actually have followers. But then sometimes there are those who want to see who they're talking to. And so sometimes your channel tends not to grow as much when you don't show yourself. Yeah, so here I am. <laughs> and then when it comes to doing live, that is another thing for a lot of people because they're concerned about being on the camera and all of that. But anyway, let's see. LP says, nice choice, Whitey. Kohlrabi is a new fall for me. Fave, okay, a new favorite. I've never had it, but I think I want to try it. It will be interesting to see how it, if I'm going to like it, yes or no. Okay, so it's the first time you're going into YT. I hope you have success with it. Growing my own. I forgot about my carrots. You mean to harvest your carrots? <laughs> I forgot to harvest mine too. Um, I harvested everything from the garden. And I'm like, yes, I'm done harvesting. I only need to harvest my kale. But I try to keep the kale out there as long as I possibly can. So... It's not that I forgot about those. And then because I was trying to get everything that must be done outdoors before it gets cold. So waiting to harvest that. But then the carrots, I forgot everything about the ones that were in my tomato bed. So thankfully, I was able to get it done. And I'm happy that I did because I was thinking, oh, it's just a few carrots. I should just leave them there. But then when I harvested them and see how many of them I would have left in the ground. And next year, they would not be edible. Well, maybe. But 
when I leave carrots to produce seeds and I harvest the seeds and take out the carrots, they're usually rock hard and covered in roots. So yes, I don't know. I don't think those would be edible. They would be very difficult to eat. So I'm glad I harvested them. Um, it says I got broccoli also. Okay, good. I tried growing broccoli last year. I didn't grow any this year. I tried growing broccoli and I don't know. They they started producing broccoli when the season was the growing season was ending. <laughs> so I wasn't able to harvest any broccoli. And then I don't know. Because the cool weather crop wasn't doing so well this year, so I didn't plant any. So next year I'm going to try, but I'm not going to try with a lot of plants, with a lot of broccolis. So I think I'm going to be doing something different with my garden this um, next year. Because as you know, I pulled down my tiered worm bin and turned it into raised beds. So I'm going to have more beds to grow my cool weather crop in. And I think I'm going to start my cool weather crop earlier than I did this year. And I'm going to be doing more of the cool weather crop. More varieties, but not necessarily more of individual plants. LP says, what was your final push to do, to do YouTube? Um, when I started YouTube, um, let's see. I started YouTube in 2013, not because I wanted to do videos. It's just that, you know, you just want an account for yourself. But I put up two videos about fish that we caught some sturgeon because we love fishing. And then my husband caught this four foot sturgeon and it was pretty big, pretty exciting. So I thought, oh, since as we like to watch fishing videos on YouTube, I'm going to put this up. So I put up the one, but nothing for years after. And then after that, when I started to get more serious about gardening, uh, occasionally I put up a video, but never really thought about being serious on YouTube until about a year and a half ago. Well, I think maybe two and a half years ago. Um, I started to get serious because what, that was 2019, yeah, January 2019. I started to get serious because I wanted to become an Amazon affiliate and I didn't want to create a website for it. So I thought, why not use YouTube? So that is how I started to get serious about YouTube. It is because I wanted to be an Amazon affiliate and I still haven't get, gotten started yet, <laughs> even though I have... I'm qualified to do so, but I still haven't gotten started yet. It's just one of those things that, I don't know, I need to spend the time and look into it more. Yes, but it is because of the Amazon affiliate program why I actually got serious about YouTube. But then as I started doing it, the videos, I noticed that the quality of my garden started improving because of YouTube. And then I started doing research um, on my plants that I'm growing, trying to find out more about them, what type of conditions they like, what kind of pests they might face and stuff like that. And then as I do that, I find that, oh, if I'm interested in this, maybe there are others who might be interested in it too. So I started sharing the information so that others can benefit as well. So here I am. <laughs> That's what gave me the push to do YouTube. Okay, you forgot that you had some carrots in the garden growing my own. <laughs> yes, hopefully you'll remember to harvest them before the growing season hen for you. LP says, my carrots have not germinated. Oh. I have to harvest my ginger and turmeric. Nice, you have ginger and turmeric. They look very sad since our last frost. They're tropical after all. Yes, I tried, um, I started garlic, not garlic, um, turmeric and ginger indoors in the spring, 
but the they didn't make it because of the fungus knot issues that I had. So they didn't make it, unfortunately. And then it's not always easy to find the Jamaican ginger. And I don't like the ginger that we get here in Saskatoon because they're very weak. They're still good, but they're not as potent as the ones I'm used in Jamaica. So for that reason, I don't want to grow those because they're ready, readily available in the store. So I want to grow the Jamaican ones. So I'm waiting until I see those in the supermarket and then I'll try try again. Hopefully I can get some going for next growing season. LP says, your carrot harvest was great. Were your kids excited? Oh, they're always excited. As soon as I brought the carrots in the house, my son was all over it. Mom, can I wash this and eat it? <laughs> yes, he was the first one to start eating. Yes, they were pretty excited. They like to see when things are harvested from the garden. Well, I do too. <laughs> I don't know. Growing your own stuff is fun. And then the carrots that we get in the supermarkets here. Oh, I don't know. I eat food here because I have to eat, but I don't really like the food that I get here because the quality is just less than ideal. <laughs> I don't know if it is the chemicals that they're using on the food, but then even when you buy, when I buy the ones that are organic, I still don't like them. So I don't know what it is. I don't know if it has to do with the elevation. I don't have to know if it has to do with the soil type. I don't know, but... I don't really enjoy food anymore. I just eat because I have to eat. But when I grow my own, I enjoy that. Yes. Yes, it's going to take a while for me to get used to what's available. Oh, thank you, LP. Let's see. It says, what kind of Jamaican pesticide secrets do you have? Um... I don't know anything about Jamaican pesticides because when I was there, I've never, my family, I've never been people who use pesticides. Maybe one of my brother who is a farmer does, but I don't really know what he uses. So I don't really know anything about pesticides in Jamaica. Yes. Because I always tend to go organic because that's how my grandfather grew his farm. He was all organic. So, Hi, no art gardener. How are you? It's been a while, eh? <laughs> Let's see. Growing my mom says, I am definitely going to try broccoli next year. Me too. I was never a big fan of broccoli. Not that I don't like it. But for some reason, maybe because I didn't grow up with my family eating a lot of broccoli when we were kids. Yes, we tend to, for green vegetables, Kalalu was just, Kalalu and Pak Choy was the way to go. So we didn't really grow up around broccoli. So it's not that I have anything against broccoli per se, but yeah. So because of that, I never really think of growing broccoli until last year. But Looking at the nutritional value or the health benefits of broccoli, I think I want to be growing more of it. And my kids like it, so. Let's see. Which comment did I miss? Okay. You took your ginger inside and wide. That's good. Oh, it says I'm in zone 7A, 7B. Okay. When should I plant ginger? I am not sure. Oh, my tummy is growling. Why? <laughs> I don't know. My tummy has been making these strange sounds since last night. <laughs> I hope it, you can't hear it. <laughs> I'm not sure when you can actually start planting ginger, but ginger requires heat. So I would say about the same time that you would plant things like peppers and stuff. If you're starting them indoors, then that's okay. 
but then if you're planting if you're starting them outdoors then i would say wait until you have temperatures at least at least 50 degrees celsius or above yes and they will take pretty long to germinate at that temperature but they should be able to germinate at that point but has to when i don't know when you start having warm weather in your zone in my region it takes a pretty long time before we can actually start anything out, outdoors because we are in zone 3b so you know it's pretty cold here we can't plant anything until may there's some that um some cool weather crop and some region in saskatchewan where they might be able to start cool weather crop late april but Yes, May is when we usually we're usually able to plant some things. But I'd wait until it is warm before I plant the um the ginger because it loves heat and it tends to like places that are damp too. So let's see. When my horn says we'll harvest them soon because something is eating the leaves. Okay. Yes, and you need to be careful too. My um something could be eating the carrots under the ground too. So it would be nice if you can get them harvested. Something started eating mine too because they were way past the date when they were supposed to be harvested. Because I planted them in May. May or June and you see that it is all the end of october i just harvested them this week so they were there for quite a bit of time and something started eating a few of them still don't know what because i didn't see anything there eating them but a few of them were being consumed so i would try to get them harvested as quickly as possible LP says ginger takes a long time. They say 10 months to harvest, though you can harvest after four average. Okay. I don't really know much about ginger in terms of how long they take because I've had ginger and turmeric. When we were growing up, um, we had turmeric, but we didn't plant them. The local, um, where we were living, they were there when we went there. And then where my husband grew up, across the road from him, there was a spring, a natural spring there. And that field was just covered with ginger. So we just go over there because it was open to the public. So we just go over there and harvest. So I don't really know how long it takes for ginger to actually grow. But it will be interesting to find out. So I'm going to try and grow my own again. They're saying hello to New Art Gardeners. LP says, your YouTube story is interesting. I can absolutely see making videos as a motivation to do even better in the garden. Maybe that alone is a good reason to start. I would say definitely it is a good reason to start because, I don't know, I think because of YouTube, my gardening is a whole lot better than it was before because i want my channel to be informative and because of that i tend to do a lot of research and then every problem that i meet in my garden i try to share it with the audience because they too might face similar challenges and sharing it with them they might be able to share with me how they overcome their challenges and then I can do research and share how I can how I overcome the challenges as well. So definitely YouTube has helped my garden to be a lot better than it would have been if I wasn't doing YouTube. Whitey says, sorry, that's what I meant. Organic pesticides. Okay. Um... To be honest, um, I've never used organic pesticides in Jamaica either. 
the biggest issue that um, I can recall facing with gardening in Jamaica is snails and slugs. And for those, I just salt them. Yes, um, I love animals, but when it comes to snails or slugs or anything that affects my garden, I was actually cruel. I would even take acid from the school, from my classroom. Yes, I did that, unfortunately. We didn't, yeah, not now, but I used to take the acid from the classroom and take it home and inject it into the snails and watch them there as they suffer. But that was pretty cruel, but I was upset that they were eating down my cabbages. But um, salt is what I used to use on them. And then wood ash, we had a lot of wood ash. So we'd use that on them. But we didn't really have a lot of issue with pests. We had a cabbage moth, but then that's only sometimes that we had to deal with them. And I don't really recall. I didn't grow cabbage. My parents did. Um, I don't recall them doing anything, using anything on it, whether organic or otherwise. So I don't know what pesticide they use for that. But if you are someone who raises worms, oh, um, I don't think you raise worms, right? But if you have access to worm castings, that's a very good pesticide for a lot of these pests. I don't know if it is good for cabbage worms, but for pests like the flying ones are those with an exoskeleton. Those ones, the worm castings, when you use it to make a worm tea, is very good for eradicating those. And for the others, I tend to use... Um, Diatomaceous earth, those are good for any type of pest that has a waxy exoskeleton. And for the cabbage, cabbage moth and worm, any type of larvae, for those I use things like um, soap with baking soda, neem oil. So those organic methods are what I use. But in Jamaica, I didn't really have a lot of issue with pests. I don't know why, but more and more these days we are getting more familiar with a lot more pests than in the past. I don't know why there are more pests these days, but could it be that because we tend to use a lot of artificial pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers in our garden, so the plant's natural ability to fight back is being affected by all of these inorganic matter. So now these pests have the opportunity to fight back and grow in population. I don't know if that's what is happening, but we seem to have far more pests than we did in the past. It's a sad thing though, but hopefully with time we'll be able to get them under control Garlic is also a very good pesticide. Crushing your garlic or blending it in water and allowing it to sit for a few hours or 24 hours and using it on your plants. Some people do not like to use um, soap, like dishwashing liquid on their, on their plants because they say it tends to burn the plant, but a few drops should be okay. So if you're going to make your own pesticide, it is a good idea to test it on each type of plant that you intend to use it on, just a leaf or two. You don't want to off your garden as soon as you make the pesticide because then if the pesticide is too strong, you can harm your plants. So for that reason, you want to test it on individual plants. It might be okay for the strength of it, it might be okay for one plant, one type of plant, but not necessarily for another. So testing the strength of it on various plant is a pretty good idea. Now the purpose of the soap really is not that it is a pesticide, but it helps to let the solution that you have made stick to the plant. So that is why the soap tends to be used in your pesticide. Let's see. And white says it's a tropical plant, so you could start it inside and then put it outdoors in the spring. 
I started mine inside before the spring. Yes, that um, the um, garlic, not garlic, why do I keep saying garlic? <laughs> Ginger and um, turmeric is tropical, so it can be started indoors. And they should be able to do well indoors where the garlic grew in our garlic. Yeah, my shop. Now, um, where the ginger grew or the turmeric grew in our yard when we were growing up, there were a lot of trees there. They were underneath the shade, but they did very well. So even I assume based on that, that even if you do not have a lot of lighting, but you have a windowsill that gets a reasonable amount of sunlight, they should be able to do well indoors. Let's see. No art gardener says you got some nice harvest this year. Yes, um, I can't complain about the harvest that I got. I was expecting more, but then with all the pests that I did, I'm satisfied with the harv all the pests that I had. I'm satisfied with the harvest that I got because at one point in time I didn't think I would have a good harvest, but thankfully I was able to harvest some things let's see okay Heidi says thanks had okay i missed one comment lp says good advice and i started mine indoors ginger and turmeric i set them outside in the spring when warm then brought them inside at night that's a good way to do it too then they get a lot more heat and they get the direct sunlight it's a lot of work though bringing the plants in and out daily but it is definitely worth the effort. Okay, when they got when it got warmer, you planted them in grow bags. Nice. Warmer winter here means more bugs survive winter. Yes, that is that is the case here too, unfortunately, but. I don't know which, um, I think I prefer the bugs, honestly. <laughs> I think I prefer the bugs. Um, I'll take the warmer winter any day then. <laughs> I can do things to try and get the bugs under control, but when the winters are brutal, there's just nothing I can do about it. I can put on layers, but I mean, if you want to use your hand, how many layers can you put on your hand and still be able to use your hand outdoors? So... I prefer the bugs. I'll take the bugs over the winter any day. Oh, and another thing, um, OIT. If you are making organic pesticides for your garden, I would recommend that you don't use the same type of pesticides all the time because these bugs are resilient. And after a while, they will get used to whatever pesticide it is that you are using. So it is a good idea to rotate the pesticides that you're using from time to time so that they won't get used to it. And another thing that you can do, if you know that you are prone to a particular type of pest and that pest likes, say for example, the type of pest that likes to go on your brassicas like your cabbage, your kohlrabi and stuff like that. Don't plant them in the same location if you know that that region is prone to that particular type of pest. Of course, there are times when, depending on the size of your garden, rotating them might not be an option. But if you can, rotate them because pets, pests have the ability to remember where they find a particular type of food. And as they... Each year, they will go back to that location looking for that type of food. So if you rotate your crop, then it makes it a bit more difficult for them to find those crops. Hi, replays. Okay, so let's see, what did I miss? And says only your tomatoes did well. I'm sorry, my dear, about that. Yeah, hopefully next year. Well, what about your um your kale and stuff? Didn't those do well? Yeah, I'm sorry that the um your garden didn't do well this time around. 
Let's see, Growing My Own says, I have a ginger that I thought had died. Then it came back up in July, still very small. Oh, interesting, nice. So are you going to, is it outdoors and are you going to leave it outdoors or are you going to bring it indoors? Okay, so. And says, I did a video on how to plant ginger. Okay, Heidi, you can check that out. Okay, so let's see. Replaces greetings. I just saw this channel in my recommended feed. By worm farming, are you referring to vermiculture? Just checking so that I am on the same page as everyone else. Yes, I'm referring to vermiculture uh, replays. Yes, I do worm farming um, for personal and commercial purposes. Do you do worm farming? Do you raise worms um, replays? LP says, good point about liking warmer winter. I do too, except we're getting more mosquitoes and ticks and they spread diseases. Okay. Yes, um, that is the unfortunate part of it. But um, because I'm in the city, so I don't really have issues with the tick, but they definitely, they definitely, um, are more plentiful in the in the summer when the time is warm here, but um, we don't really have much is issue with them in the city. But if I was on an acreage, then I would have to be concerned. Okay, let's see. LP says, yes, you did on white, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, your green leafy vegetables did well too. Okay, good. Okay, LP is, offer, is answering replays. She said yes, vermiculture. Let's see, growing my own says, I'm thinking of bringing it indoors. Okay, yes. Um, since as it is trying so hard to survive, it would be nice if you can bring it indoors and get it to make it through the winter. It obviously doesn't want to die. <laughs> Hi, Chain Breaker, how are you? He says, hey, White, this may be a stupid question, but are different worm types more productive than others? There are no such thing as stupid questions, my dear, but there are such things as stupid answers. <laughs> if you don't ask questions, you will never learn. So questions are made to be asked. Um, some worms are said to be more productive than others, but then each worm farmer tend to have a different experience. So for some... It is the general belief that the red wigglers are the most productive of all the composting worms. Um, but then there are those who raise a combination of worms and some beg to differ. Some will say it is the African nightcrawlers. Some will say it is the European nightcrawlers. But for the most part, it is said that the red wigglers are the most productive. When it comes to rate of reproduction, the red wigglers definitely are number one because the others do not reproduce at the rate that the red wigglers do but then in terms of size all the other worms are larger than the red wigglers and so for that reason per body size they each worm can consume more but because the red wigglers reproduce more so they have a larger volume than the other worms so I would say either the red wigglers do better or they balance out the equation. So I'm not really sure. 
I hope that was um I was able to answer your question where that is concerned. So for those of you who raise worms, um, for raise more than one species of worms, have you ever done a comparison of the various worms that you raise and see which one do better? That is also one of the experiments that I'm going to be doing for this winter because now that I have the African night crawlers, I want to compare them with my red wigglers and my European night crawlers. But since as I got rid of most of my Canadian night crawlers, I don't think I'll be able to do the experiment with them because I don't have enough of them for that. But with these three worms, I'm going to be doing a comparison to see which one. In fact, maybe I can. I don't know. I'm going to check in my Canadian red wiggler worm bin outdoors and see if I have enough large mature Canadian night crawlers to put them in, in the experiment as well. So I want to compare all of them and see, giving them all of them the same circumstances, same amount of food scraps, same treatment, and to see how they reproduce, which one produce more. And I'm going to keep them all in the same location. So that is an experiment that I'm going to actually start very soon. So I'm going to be keeping them inside the home because then I can monitor them better because I don't want to be going out in the garage very often because then I have to be out in the cold to get to the garage. So I'm going to keep them indoors and do the experiment. So maybe you can follow along with that um, chain breaker and see how it turns out. I will see... Um, in terms of how many how much castings they produce, how much um, cocoons they lay, and how many hatchlings I will get from those cocoons. So I won't know how many hatchlings I get from individual cocoons, but yeah. So you can follow along when I start that experiment. Let's see. LP is asking, replays, are you a fellow worm lover? Okay, saying hi to Chainbreaker. LP says, not a stupid question. Yes, some are. White Davy will answer soon. So if you, if you are someone who raised different types of worms, you might want to answer that question as well. It would be interesting to know what your experience is regarding that. Let's see, replay says, great, I'm just getting into this, into this. I'm about to move into my first house as an owner. Awesome, congratulations, my dear. And I'm looking for non-chemical ways to increase the quality of the soil in my property. Definitely, vermicomposting is the way to go, hands down. No questions asked, vermicomposting is the best way. Because you can add other organic matter to your, you can add other organic matter to your garden, and it will work very well. But then, composting worms have an advantage over other forms of revitalizing or amending your soil. For one, the castings, the worms are going to aerate your your soil. The castings is going to help to minimize certain types of pests in your garden. The casting has far more nutrients than what can be found in other organic matter. Apart, um, I don't know about commercial organic fertilizers because I don't use those. And the worms themselves are able to break down some heavy metal that can be found in the soil so that alone in itself is a big plus so definitely adding worms to your garden is going to be worth it whether you're going to put the worms directly in your garden or you're going to have a worm bin whichever you choose is going to be worth it having a worm bin is advantageous than having them in the soil of course if they're in the soil they will aerate it which they can't do if they're in a um, worm bin. But at the same time, you 
cannot monitor how much castings you have when the worms are in the soil. You cannot make worm tea with the castings. And the advantage of being able to make worm tea is that because it acts as a pesticide, you can put it directly, spray the liquid directly onto the, the foliage of the plants, which will help to control those pests that likes to be on the leaves of the plant. So having a worm bin is advantageous to having the worms in the soil. But another thing is, if you have a worm bin and you're raising your own worms, you will eventually have those worms that are in your bin. You're going to have that type of worm in your soil too, because no matter how good you are, the worm eggs, some of the eggs are going to end up in the castings and some of the um, the hatchlings are going to end up in the castings that you put in the garden. So having a worm bin, if you have the space and the time to look after it, then definitely that is most advantageous. Okay, um, we're in my honey saying hi. Now let's see. Okay, they're saying a lot of readings. Um, let's see if I can pronounce this. Tell me if I get this right. Hill shat Hill said. Um, I don't know if I got that right. All right, I'll just say Pierterson. Okay, so OIT says, what's the benefit of worm of a worm garden and how and when do I use it? Do I harder worms or buy a worm from bait shop? Very clueless, but very interested. Okay, so you just heard me list some of the benefits of having a worm farm. So I don't know if you're talking about having a worm bin or having worms in your garden. Either way, you just heard me discuss some of the benefits of having them in the soil. Um, worms in your soil, the castings in your soil will help to prevent soil erosion. It will help to stabilize your plants because it helps to prevent soil erosion. It will amend your soil. So if you have soil that tends to be clay or hard, then having the worm castings in it will make your soil loose. If you're someone who wants to or someone who practice a no-till garden, having a lot of castings in your garden will also help you with that because because it helps to loosen your soil, so you don't necessarily have to till your soil. So that is one advantage of having worm castings in your garden. Now for worms, you can get worms from suppliers who specifically sell worms for pet food or for vermicomposting, or you can buy worms at the bait shop now if you buy bait at the bait shop it's going to be more expensive but sometimes depending on where you are that is the only um, source that you can get your worms from if that is the only source you can get your worms from then by all means get it from there but i'd advise that you look around your region and see if there are suppliers that you can get worms from who will sell worms either by quantity in terms of a pound of worms or a thousand worms or yes because then if you buy it that way it will be cheaper and you will get more worms for your money sometimes if you can't find a supplier who will sell you a pound of worm you can get worms online where are you located yes sometimes you can get worms online there are people who are willing to ship worms some might ship worms internationally, but there are some countries that are cautious about having worms imported. So you may or may not have an issue with that. So you have to keep those things in mind if you're going to be sourcing worms internationally. I hope you are able to find worms locally though. And sometimes depending on where you are too, 
you might be able to find composting worms that are readily available in your soil. Um, something that you could do to find out if you have worms that are good for composting in your soil is you could get a container with food scraps, cover it up, put some holes in the bottom of it. You could either, I'd recommend that you dig a hole and put the container in because then larger pests might be able to come and move the container or get into the container. So I'd recommend burying it and just leave just the top of the container open so that you can remove the cover and keep on adding food scraps. Now, if you have composting worms in your soil, over a period of time, they are going to find that container with the food scraps and they're going to start going in there and then you can use that to extract them and start a worm bin. Gas stations usually sell composting worms. They sell it for bait. Um, Walmart sell it as well. Um, anywhere that sell bait for fishing will have composting worms as well. So those are some places that you can check for worms. Okay, so back to Peter Tyson. He says, greetings. If your red regular worm bin becomes overpopulated and you don't wish to have two, to have a second bin, can you place the extra worms in the garden bed? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you can put the extra worms in your garden bed. Keep in mind that if you are in a region that experiences freezing temperatures for extended period of time, those worms will die. However, their cocoons will survive the freezing and those cocoons will hatch as soon as the time gets warm enough. So you will always have those red wigglers in your worm bin. It's just that most of them are going to, every year they're going to die off, but the cocoons will survive. Now, when worms realize that they are going to die off, they will produce a lot of cocoons in order to continue their species. So you don't have to worry about worms being in your garden. But if you're someone like me who feels sorry for them, then... <laughs> The good thing though is that if you're if you have a, ray, a worm bin and your bin is producing too much worms, after a while your worms are going to slow down their rate of reproduction because they realize that they don't have enough food to take care of all the worms and they don't have enough space for the worm population. So they are going to slow down their rate of reproduction. So you're going to always have your red wigglers, but they're going to control their population. So you really don't have to worry about your worm being, being overpopulated because as the worms re realize that this is the norm now where there's always so much of them in the bin, they will regulate the amount of them that are actually in the bin. Another thing that you could do too is find out if there are people around you who would like to have red wigglers. If you have friends who would like to raise worms, you can either give it to them or if you want, you can always sell it to them as well. So you have quite a few options where that is concerned. Okay, so let's see. Chainbreaker says, thank you for that. Okay, you are welcome. Repeat. Replays says, not super scientific, but it was interesting. Okay. LP says, Cong congrats, replay on your new home. Chain Breaker says, I will definitely follow along. Okay. LP says, I have not done any kind of experiment to really measure who was most productive. That said, the red wiggler, the red worm mix I bought seemed to be the most productive. Okay. The mix is red wigglers and blue worms. Okay. Thanks for sharing that, LP. Okay. Replay says, thank you. LP says, European night crawlers are definitely good to have, but I've found that they don't eat as much as the blue mix. Okay. Production also depend on conditions 
all men do best in warm months versus winter yes worms on a whole will slow down in the winter because the conditions are just not ideal for them and also as you rightly said lp condition does play a part in how well worms do so if you're raising different types of worms and you have them in say for example different locations where they might be exposed to different conditions or maybe the condition in the bin in each bin is different from the other then you're going to have different results where production is concerned too so that is another factor to keep in mind replaces i want to put my worms in my garden and in my soil because of aeration i have a question related to aeration can worms aerate clay soil if so how deep do they aerate they can aerate clay soil of course it's going to take them longer than it would if it was but um composting worms are Usually surface dwellers, especially the red wigglers, these are surface dwellers. The Euro, um, the night crawlers, not necessarily European, but all the night crawlers, they tend to like to travel up and down throughout the soil. So they are even better for aerating your soil than if you were to use red wigglers, because the red wigglers tend to like to settle in the food. They will live in wherever the food source is, that's where they will be, which is usually on the surface. The European, Canadian, African night crawlers, they will tend to be more, go deeper into the soil. In fact, they can go as deep as 12 feet based on a research that I did. I don't know how true the research is, but based on the research that I did, it says that they can go as deep as 12 feet. So they will take the food source and travel up and down throughout the soil. So if you're going to get them for aerating your soil, I would say go with one of the night crawlers. Keep in mind though where you are, if you're in somewhere that experience freezing temperatures, um, where the soil will freeze, how deep does your soil freeze? You want to keep that in mind. You want to keep the type of night crawler that you'll be getting in mind as well. Because if you are in free areas that has freezing temperature, your African night crawlers will not survive. So don't get not African night crawlers. The European night crawlers and the Canadian night crawlers can survive because they will just go below the depth to which your soil freeze. So they will burrow down below the freezing um, table, if that's the word to use there. But yes. So if you're getting those type of worms, if you're getting worms for aeration purposes, then get the ones that will burrow down into your soil. And another thing that you can do too while you are, because you can only get so much worms, right? I don't think you're going to be going out and getting yourself 100 pounds of worms or 50 pounds of worms. I don't know what's the size of your garden space, so it will take a while for your worms to actually multiply and have enough where they can aerate the entire garden in a short period of time. So what you can do in the meantime while you had worms to your garden and you're waiting for them to aerate the soil and to amend the soil is to add whether compost or food scraps to your garden. You can keep adding this to your garden as often as you can. And it is recommended that if you're just going to start a garden for the first time, you can add up to 10 inches of compost and or food scraps to your garden. You can choose to just put it on the surface or till it into the soil. I'd recommend tilling it into the soil because if your soil is just clay, chances are that it will not have a lot of nutrients in it that the plants will need. Um, it chances are also that it will not have a lot of the beneficial microbes and other organisms that are there that your plants can benefit from. So in this case, for the first year, if you're someone who is thinking about doing a no-till garden, I'd recommend the first year, 
you actually till that soil and work that organic matter in. Because if it is just on the surface, then it's going to take a while for that material to break down and actually perform the work that you want it to. So for the first year, I'd recommend tilling the soil, mixing that organic matter in. And then after that, every year, it's recommended that you had two or so inches of organic matter to your soil. I hope that helps. Let's see. LP says, I keep mine in my basement, not finished, getting as low as 45 to degrees Fahrenheit, which is 7 to 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. Yes, um, worms, composting worms. The Canadian nightcrawlers don't mind temperatures of minus four. In fact, they survive outdoors, which in my region can go pretty low. Yes, so they survive outdoors. They will freeze if they don't go below the frost line, but they can survive very cold temperatures. The European nightcrawlers and other worms, they like temperatures. The temperatures has to be 10 degrees C or above. Now for African nightcrawlers, it has to be 20s in the 20s for them to be happy. So while your worms will survive temperatures like 10 degrees C, you will find that they're going to slow down drastically at that temperatures. If the temperature is like 18 and above for your red wigglers, they will do better than if it is 10 degrees. So if you don't want your, your worms to slow down too much in the, in the winter, then you try to keep them at a temperature around 20, 21 in that region or above, then they should do well. But if it is lower than that, they are going to slow down drastically. Let's see. LP says, White Davy, I would love to see that experiment. Yes, um, I'm going to get it started as soon as possible. I'm hoping that I can get it started this week, but I have a few things that I'm trying to get started out. So I bought the bins that I'm going to be using for those experiments. So I need to create the bins, making it pest proof, especially for those fungus nuts and fruit flies, because I'm going to be having those bins indoors. So I'm going to have to create the beans first and then I'm going to have to select the worms that I want to use because I'm going to make sure that all the worms that I'm using from each species of worms, they're all going to be adult worms. So, yes, I'm going to see if I can get that started out, get that experiment started within the next week or so. Let's see. Replaces White David, thank you for responding to my question. Very helpful. I would like to hang around more, but I have to go meet my wife at the birthing center for an, for an appointment. Okay, all the best to you, my dear. Thank you for being a part of the live. And if you have any more questions in the future, you can always email me or contact me through one of um, through a comment in one of my videos. I'll be happy to answer whatever questions I can. Oh, birth coming in in four weeks. Congratulations. I hope all go well and you enjoy the new member of your family. Let's see. Newark Gardner says, thank you for coming through replays. Newark Gardner says, Con congratulations on your new baby. Pray for it. Pray it is healthy and happy. Congratulations on your new... Okay, I read that already. LP says, take care and congrats on the new baby. Pray for your family. Oh, this must be pretty exciting times for him. Baby on the way, new house, garden to plan. Oh, should be fun. It's going to be a lot of work though, but it's going to be exciting times. <laughs> 
Yes, having a baby is always exciting, but it has its lots, its work. A lot of work cut out for you there, but it's gonna be exciting. Yes. Okay, we've been running for quite a while. My daughter doesn't have school today. Today we meet with the pair, with the teachers. So there is no school for the kids and I already had my meeting. So we were able to have the live a little longer than is usual. Um, LP is asking if I've looked into blue worms anymore. No, I haven't looked into the blue worms yet. And now that I have the African night crawlers, I think I'm going to spend some time observing them before actually thinking about getting the blue worms because it's kind of tricky with the African night crawlers because as you know, in my region, it is cold seven to nine months out of the year. It is cold for tropical worms. So, I don't want to get the blue worms just yet until I know that the African night crawlers are going to be okay. Yes, um, still not sure if they're going to be okay yet. So far they seem to be doing good, but we haven't reached the peak of winter yet. Well, on record, winter hasn't started yet. Um, so not until after February has ended before I know if the African night crawlers are going to make it. I think they will, but will they be happy? Because it's not just a matter of them surviving the winter. I don't want them to suffer. So for that reason, I'm not going to consider getting the blue worms yet until I know that the African night crawlers are okay. Yes, and then another thing is considering where to keep them because if I don't have to have them in the house, then that would be superb. But for now, at least one of my African nightcrawler bin is in the house. That we are know that at least these ones should be safe. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on them and I'm, I'll be giving you guys update on how they're doing. Yes, after I see how they do over the course of the winter, then I'll consider the blue worms. Let's see. LP says, good call waiting, maybe next year. Yes. Peterson says, earlier in the chat, you mentioned using salt for slugs and snails. How do you apply the salt? Thank you. Okay, um, for the salt, when I see the snails, I put the salt on them. That's how I apply it. However, um, so too much salt in your garden can be the <coughs> dangerous in the sense that salt prevents your guard, your plants from being able to absorb the nutrients from the soil. So even if your garden has all the nutrients that the plants need, if there is too much salt in your garden, it can prevent the plant from absorbing the nutrients. So I usually just, once I see the snail or the slugs, I just sprinkle the salt directly on them. You could also do where you create a barrier around your entire garden and put the salt around it. And then the, work, the, the snails will not want to crawl over the salt because the salt will dissolve their bodies. So that will work. Ash, wood ash, is better to use for the snails and slugs than the salt because then it does not have a negative effect on your garden. In fact, wood ash is very rich in potassium, not potassium, in um, phosphorus. You still have to be careful with too much of it in the garden, though. Your plants still will be able to absorb nutrients, unlike if you have too much salt. But too much phosphorus in your garden can also affect your plants negatively. So you still have to be careful of how much of it you have in your garden again you can just sprinkle it directly on the snails when you see them that way you won't end up with too much of it in your garden 
and the plants will benefit from the phosphorus that is there. Um, for the salt, although I mentioned that too much salt can build up in your garden, it takes a really long time for the salt to build up in your garden. And this is why a lot of time gardeners find that if they use artificial fertilizers or inorganic fertilizers, over a period of time, they have to keep changing the type of fertilizers that they use. And even when they change their fertilizers, sometimes they got the, the farm still does not do as well as it should because most um, inorganic fertilizers has a lot of salt in it. And then over, over the years, it just keeps building up, building up, building up. And then you find that your soil is like this and you just don't get what you're supposed to get from it. So be careful with the amount of salt. If you want to create a barrel, you could probably get a, con um, well, containers with salt would be a bit overkill because you'd have to find a lot of containers to put the salt in for the snails to, to go around your entire garden. So that might not work, but if you, and then when the rain comes, the salt is going to dissolve, but just sprinkle it directly on the snails and that should work. But those ones are a bit tricky to um, control. Um, there are some people who use snail baits or slug baits in their garden. Um, some say it works, some say it doesn't. I don't really know much about slug baits, so that is another option, something that you could look into as well. But I usually just sprinkle the salt on the snails. Okay, Chainbreaker says congratulations. I guess he's talking to replays. And White says, what is the correct way to plant mint with other herbs as it is invasive? That's a pretty good question. Um, for... Any species that you have that is invasive, mint or otherwise, if you're going to be putting it in your garden and your garden is not a container garden, the best way to plant them so that they do not invade the rest of your garden is to put them in a container, grow it in a container and bury that container in your garden. So you have it growing in your garden, but at the same time, the roots are not able to travel all over your garden and to sp spread new suckers. So that's how you control invasive species. Now, if you're going to do that, you have to keep in mind that if your the container that you have them in has holes in it, it is going to, some of the roots may escape and actually start growing. So if you see that happening, you're going to have to remove those young suckers that you see coming up outside of that container as much as often as you see them, as soon as you see them. Another thing is that each year you might want to take that mint out of the container and prune the roots of it so that it does not become root bound and so that um, the roots won't get to spread to the rest of the garden through the holes that are in that container. But once you have it in a container, it will control the rate at which the roots will spread in your garden. Let's see. Yes, um, Noir Gardeners got that right. She says, I, I put all my, all my mints in containers. That is the best way to grow them so that they do not invade your garden and not just mint but any plant that you have that is invasive that you want to grow but you want to control them now it's nice having your mints and stuff like that in your in your garden and not just um by itself in one corner because mints do act as a pest repellent in the garden so put it in a container and put it in the garden LP says some people use beer to bait slugs. Yes, I've heard I've heard of that using beer to bait slugs. I don't know what it is that attracts them, but that I've heard that it works pretty well.
Okay, um, you want me to repeat about the mint? You can have holes in the container, but once you have holes in the container, you know that the chances are that a root or two will escape through the holes in the container. So having it in a container will slow down the rate at which the roots spread. So it will help to control how much the, you, the mint spread over in your garden. But at the same time, you can prune the root of your plants every now and then. And if you see young suckers coming out outside of the container, then you can cut or pull up those new suckers another thing that you can do is those containers that you grow your mint in you can if it has holes in it just rest the container in another catchment tray as it were and then put it in your garden because once it is in the catchment tray the roots are just going to be going in the tray and not into your soil so that is how you would help to control the mint invading the rest of your garden yeah, so you can have it with the rest, but just put it in a container. Grow it in a container, put the container in a catchment tray. Okay, the slugs will get drunk and drown. Okay. You're welcome. I've never had to deal with snails or slugs in this region, so I'm pretty thankful for this. They are, they heat a lot compared to a lot of the pests that I have to deal with here. They can go through quite a lot of crop in no time. So I'm pretty happy that I don't have to deal with them. I've seen snails in Saskatoon, but I've never really seen them round about my region. I've seen them in other people's yard, but the other side of the cities where I've seen them, but it's, They've never really been a, a problem for gardeners in the city as far as I know because there's not a lot of them here. I don't know if maybe it's too cold. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm being in a cold environment does has its advantages. Okay. So let's see. You said you will put it in one of your herb box. Okay. That should work. Health Peace says, I probably shouldn't let my mint go to seed. Was not thinking, just happy the pollinators were happy. <laughs> yes, my mint um, did go to seed too, um, one of them, but it was in a container. So I don't know if in that location where it was, I don't know if the seeds fell, if some of the seeds fell. So we'll see next year if any decide to grow. I don't know if they can even survive the winter. Yes, yeah, so I don't know if the mint can survive. And my Italian basil that went to seed as well. And I think some of those fell inside the raised beds as I was growing them in. So it will be interesting to see if any start to grow next year. So quite a few things I'm expecting to grow that start to grow that I didn't plant this year because quite a few things went to seed and I didn't get to pull them out or harvest the seeds before the seeds fall. But it will be interesting. It will be a new experience for me where that is concerned. <laughs> yes, I have quite a, quite a few different type of lettuce that went to seed and the seed fell off. I didn't harvest a lot of them. So we'll see what grows back and what doesn't and see if those seeds can survive our very cold winters here. Let's see. Noir Gardner says, the snail eat up my hostas. Okay, I'm sorry about that, my dear. So did you use the beer to control them? Did you um, use the beer as a bait for them? Yeah, so it will be fun to see what next year garden is like. I'm already anticipating it. <laughs> it 
it's a pity I have so long to wait. I have what two months leaving this year and six more months next year. Oh my goodness, I have eight months to wait before I can actually plant a garden. That's sad. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see what happens. In the meantime, I'm just going to spend the time and plan for what I intend to grow. Plan my garden. Let's see. Okay, LP says, oh no, you are gardens. Yes, it's always sad when those pests decide to invade our garden. And if they would come on and just take a little and go, it would be fine. But they just come and they just behave as if they think the entire garden is for them. I don't know what they're thinking. But anyway, hopefully next year you'll have better success with your garden, New York Gardener. Let's see. You're excited about next year too, LP. Yes. And I think I'm going to try the kohlrabi. And I got some... Lupini, I don't know if that if I got the name right, but I got some seeds from um, growing my own this year, but I didn't get to plant them. I'm out of growing space, but now that I have a few more raised beds, I'm going to try growing them next year and see. I'll be able to, if they grow, I'll be able to see what they're like. So I'm going to grow quite a few things next year that I've never seen or heard of or grown before. So I'm looking forward, definitely looking forward to that. Most mints are perennial and will come back. That is true, but in my region, not really. <laughs> yes, in my region, most things that are perennial will not come back. Thing in my region, shrubs will come back. A lot of things has to be modified to grow here, unfortunately. So we'll see. It will be interesting, though, to see if they actually do. Yeah, so anyway, I'm going to be saying goodbye in a little bit. Yes, I need to go get myself some lunch. <laughs> yeah, so it was nice talking with you guys. It was really fun and that lively discussion. I hope you guys will have a lovely weekend, that you will stay safe, and that you will keep gardening over the winter. So even if you can't plant, you can start planning your garden over the winter, collecting your seeds and stuff. Um, I don't know what's going to happen for this year or for next year growing season where seeds are concerned because it seemed like because of the pandemic, a lot of things are actually getting scarce in some regions, not all regions. And then, I don't know. So if you can, anything that you can get now, then and you know that your region is prone to suffer from scarcity then try get those things as early as you can and start planning for your garden and have fun let's see um lp says great chat thanks so much for hosting it have a great weekend everyone okay yes so thank you all for being here for taking part in the discussion um Peterson says, thanks for the informative program. Have a lovely lunch. LP says, excellent advice. I will try to get seeds early. Work Garden says, I really enjoy this live. Have a productive weekend. See you in the next live. Okay, so I will see you on Monday at 5 p.m. Um, Saskatoon, uh, Saskatchewan time. Uh, Han White says, have a wonderful weekend, everyone. So stay safe and happy gardening. <laughs>